I'm on my own today. Stella is not joining me, but I am talking to Laura Becker. And Laura is a detransitioner advocate, writer, and artist who travels internationally sharing her experience of trauma and transition to raise awareness about psychological issues affecting Gen Z and the medical ethics involved in trans health. I've been wanting to speak to Laura for a long time, and you may be familiar with her. She's a really dynamic, creative, intelligent, and she uh, gave a great interview today. So she also has an autism diagnosis, which we talk about a little bit um, today. And we talk about how those traits overlap with what she calls the archetypal FTM. It's a really interesting conversation based on a piece that she wrote. And today she also explains the way in her life, chronic abuse led to what she calls complex PTSD and trauma. And at 19, Laura was prescribed testosterone and she had a radical double mastectomy to remove her healthy breast tissue. At age 22, she was diagnosed with complex PTSD, which included the trauma from this medicalization. She detransitioned in 2019 and has since been an outspoken activist known for her unique perspective, which you'll hear about today on things like gender, culture, and philosophy, which she writes about on Twitter and her substack, Funky Psyche. So I, I talked to Laura today about her ideas, her philosophy, and particularly this kind of archetypal FTM, which I think is a great description of this quirky, sensitive, uh, creative kid. And I also kind of asked her to elaborate on what she calls kind of trauma and wiring and complex PTSD. These are ideas I've been diving into, and I wanted her to talk a little bit more about that from a less clinical lens, just so that we could understand what she was describing. So she shares a bit about her childhood and growing up in her family. Um, when she references something called high openness, I just wanted to give you a little heads up. She's talking about a trait identified in the Big Five personality test, which is really interesting. And I'll link to an article that I wrote about Big Five and gender. And one of the things I really appreciated about today's conversation is the way Laura describes um, the ROGD girl and misdirected creativity. As we know, many of the girls who are questioning their gender tend to be very uh, creative, artistic. Some of them are writers, visual artists, and she believes that they end up channeling all of their creativity into these queer theory ideas. So she elaborates on that. And when we shift over into our premier uh, Substack conversation for subscribers there, she talks about how you can discuss gender transition and the, the related issues from a medical ethics perspective, which I think is a framework that really sidesteps a lot of the political issues that tend to get in the way of talking about gender. And she tells us about her experience in 2023 going to the American Academy of Pediatrics conference along with Fair in Medicine. So I highly recommend going to our Substack so that you can check out that extended part of the conversation. But for now, here is my discussion with Laura Becker. Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. And this is Gender, A Wider Lens, a podcast dedicated to the shifting concepts around gender in our contemporary culture. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, we seek to open up the discourse around this hot-button issue. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Laura, welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have you here. Glad I could finally make it, Sasha. <laughs> we don't have uh, my lovely co-host Stella here with us today, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm sure we'll find plenty to talk about. Um, I know, of course, that you've shared your kind of story of how you ended up transitioning and detransitioning in lots of different places. But I guess we could start somewhere different today, which is you've had some time to reflect on like how you came to that place, what you've learned since, and you've written about your reflections. And one of the things that you've written about, which I thought was super interesting, was what you're calling the archetypal FTM, the sensitive, artistic, quirky, weird girl. And yes. I'm wondering if we can dive into that concept today. I, I thought it was really interesting. Of course, as, as you said in your piece, 
it's not a comprehensive version of every single person who adopts a trans identity, but there definitely are some common themes there that I think will be familiar to lots of people who love someone who's going through gender dysphoria. So um, can you talk a little bit about like, how, how did you come up with this concept? Was it something that you've known for a long time or did it kind of dawn on you in phases that that was a pattern? I feel like, you know, I detransitioned in 2019, kind of before it started to really blow up. Um, so I've had a lot of time just sort of outside of like public um, focus and just kind of observing it from a grassroots perspective of just like individual people. And then just remembering, you know, what I've seen um, of people that are still in the ideology, whether they be trans or non-binary or just some form of queer. So it's something that I came up with a couple of years ago. So, and the more that I've researched about it, the more that I've come to believe that it is a, a easy, accessible way to understand it without the pathologizing, without the diagnostic labels, or without some of the like cult sort of language um, of like the gender identity stuff. Um, so for me, it's something I've observed in myself and all of my detransitioned female peers. And I feel like every trans identified person that I've met that's a female to male person um, has fallen into this. And, you know, there's a lot of overlap with autistic traits. But again, like, what even is autism? I still don't really know, um, even though yeah. I was diagnosed as being on the spectrum when I was 11. Um, so that's why I feel like the term archetype is more helpful because it's a way of conceptualizing this type of person that keeps popping up over and over and over again. You know, what are the things that they have in common? The four kind of things that I've picked up on were number one, that they're, they're sensitive. So they might be physically sensitive to um, different like sensory or tactile things. So they're more sensitive about their bodies. They're gonna be more sensitive to hormonal changes. Um, then they're more emotionally sensitive, um, more psychologically sensitive. Maybe they're more sensitive to sort of the more sentimental qualities of life. Like, um, they're very focused on people, very interpersonally focused on emotions and stories and relationships. So in a sense, it's a very feminine, um, sort of, uh, note, I suppose, like a glass of <laughs> wine, it's a feminine <laughs> note, um, the sensitivity <laughs> But as well, like it's a spectrum, just like with we see, what we see with autism, which is the the hypersensitivity or the hyposensitivity, uh, which would be a lack of sensitivity. So because it's a spectrum of sensitivity, you can see people that are you know really really sensitive to their bodies and you're compartmentalizing it every single aspect, or people that are actually becoming dissociated from their bodies because they're hyposensitive. So there would be a reduction in how they relate to their physical space. Again, that's another overlap with autism or neurodivergence that, you know, like spatial relations can be kind of different. Mirroring body language um, is a big part of it. So they might be more sensitive to social cues and they're more emotional. And so they're more preoccupied with what people might think of them and, you know, moment to moment. Or they're completely up, they're obtuse to uh, the social cues, and that can be caused by a mirroring issue, like a neuron mirroring issue. Which um, again, I still don't fully understand how that manifests in autism, but that's definitely something that I've observed. And then the second would be that they can, can are. I, can I oh, make yeah, a quick on. point? Are you moving on to the artistic aspect now? I was gonna go to the quirky. Okay. I, I want to just make a quick point about sensitivity. Um, I, I w Something that I have kind of heard from parents, because I consult with a lot of parents, is that the sensitivity, the way that may show up in like a practical example would be, you know, if you're the parent of multiple kids and you talk to your kids pretty much the same way, then the you know, more typical child that doesn't have this hypersensitivity. If you say, hey, you didn't empty the dishwasher. I asked you to do it three times. They'll be like, fine, you know, and they'll just go empty the dishwasher. 
the sensitive child may p- perceive that as like, you're really yelling at me and it's breaking my heart and you hate me. And why are you so mean to me? So I just want to point out like the way this would show up because people might be thinking like sensitivity, how like we're all sensitive, like I get it. But I think in my experience, kids who have this like very sensitive nature, things that seem really benign to another child or to another person may be just kind of like absorbed very, very strongly. And the parent recognizes soon that like, okay, I have to be particularly gentle with this child because he or she sometimes thinks I'm yelling when I'm not, or um, like perceives every single kind of like minute thing that happens in a social interaction. Like if me and my husband are having a conversation, my kid thinks we're fighting, like things like that. And I wonder if you have anything else to add to that, but I just wanted to provide an example of, I think what you're like referencing. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, I mean, another way to talk about that would be to think of like the highly sensitive person um, that the HSP. um, Yes. HSP. Um, which is someone who, again, is, I mean, the theory, it is, it's a theory. There's some research. I haven't gone deep into it. Um, so I don't want to speak for certain, but you know, there, there might be, um, a physiological sensitivity. So they are physically more sensitive, but you can also see this again with autism. You can also see it with someone who has, um, you know, a mood disorder, or, or trauma where they are going, their amygdala is going to be more sensitive to criticism or perceived criticism. And again, trauma would be on a spectrum. So this might be just a smaller thing and it might just be occurring in puberty when adolescents would be more, would be more hypersensitive emotionally. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a trauma that they're more sensitive, but in my case and a lot of the cases that I've seen, you know, there is trauma present. And, you know, your brain is wired to react strongly, uh, even in situations where it's not warranted. Um, so that it's definitely um, exactly what you said. Um, and I think, I guess I could go into the artistic part. Um, it doesn't really matter the order of the traits, but so okay. the second one is artistic. So what does that mean exactly? What I mean by that is, uh, the personality um, characteristic of having high openness to experience or just high openness. So when you have high openness, you're going to be more um, interested or curious in other ways of being ideas, concepts, abstractions. You're going to be a more creative person in the um, typical cultural sense of art, you know, visual art, music, dance, um, pursuing other cultures, spirituality. Um, so you're going to be artistic in that sense. How that relates to the sensitivity would be someone who's quite sentimental, right? Or someone who is emotionally volatile. Um, so there can be some overlap there. And the creativity is, and the high openness to experience is, I think, one of the telltale signs of someone who is going to be vulnerable to adopting a trans identity. Because what is a trans identity? It is literally, you know, apparently outside of the binary. So it's outside of the norm. It's an abstract idea. How can you abstract your sense of self or your soul or whatever kind of spiritual metaphysical quality you want to attribute to you? Um, They're going to, of course, be very interested in queer theory, in um, the critical theories, in anything that's deconstructing the norm. And so, again, this is where we get innovation. This is where we get... um, you know, so much beauty and exploration in, in human culture, but it's also these people that are going to be vulnerable to the trans cult, to the non-binary cult, and to getting wrapped up in the fantasy and the magical thinking that you are able to become another sex or you don't have to, you know, be limited to your biology. Because if you have very high openness, you're going to be exploring, you're going to always be reaching beyond and having these divergent um, ways of thinking, which is to tie all these different ideas together. So you get a web of these abstract ideas. And then for various reasons, you are, you know, you don't have a strong relationship to your body or the physical world, because you might be more cerebral. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's where you get the manifestation of the trans the transition fantasy. 
Yeah. So it's this willingness to consider impossible possibilities that both creates like the the beauty of this creative type of person and also their vulnerability to kind of buying into ideas and theories that are not grounded. It's like I'm imagining this ethereal person like untethered to reality, which creates the artistic capacity and that free thinking and that thinking outside the box and also the ability to get swept up. And I, I wonder if you have found this observation to be true in, in my experience, particularly with the generation of young people who grow up online, if they have a combination of some social difficulties and a robust online fantasy life, they also lack the ability to kind of reality test their ideas and so they can really get wrapped up in a fantasy that is validated on the internet, like in a lot of these groups where it's other young creatives and they're writing fan fiction or they're like talking about all of these esoteric ideas. It's all language. So there's no actual reality testing of those concepts. And these young people tend to be, for many different reasons, I think, lacking a strong, robust in-person friend group where they can test out ideas and concepts. Do, do you see that stuff happening as well? Absolutely. I mean, I think, again, th there is a distinction between the current cohort, which is the ROGD type cohort. I, so I view the, um, the type of person who I will adopt a trans identity in a couple different categories. Number one, the, the ROGD type. This is the type that was a typically feminine or typically masculine boy. And then in adolescence, usually related to online or social dynamics at school, they adopt the transgender fantasy. That is a specific mm -hmm. type. That's the most common we're seeing today. Then there's the, um, the you know, kind of chronically gender nonconforming, typically homosexual type, which was gender nonconforming in childhood, continues throughout adolescence, and then adopts the transgender fantasy um, to try and uh, fit themselves into an easier category, uh, you know, that makes more yeah. sense, whether for for sexual and romantic or relational purposes or or other, you know, ideas. Um, and then the third would be someone who's doing it out of a fetish, uh, sexual fantasy, typically mostly in males. But if you look at these different types I think the archetypal FTM still applies to all of these types, but it mostly applies to the ROGD girl, whether they're autistic or not. Um, because for me, I am heterosexual, but I was gender nonconforming throughout childhood. And so basically, if, you know, if you're chronically gender nonconforming, you're typically going to be homosexual or you're autistic, um, at least today just because of the rigidness of what we're imposing. Um, mm -hmm. But to, to go back to what I was saying is, I'm trying to remember why I brought that up, um, too divergent of thoughts. Um, what I was going to get well, into was, mm. sorry, go, what were you going to say? I was going to try to help you come back, but it seems like you're there. So keep going. <laughs> I'm somewhere. Um, so... <laughs> What I was going to say was that when you have the, you know, the high openness and then you have mm. the sensitivity, you're also then going to have quirkiness and you're going to have weirdness. So I wanted to find the difference between quirkiness and weirdness because sometimes they're used synonymously. How I define the weirdness is when it becomes either pathological or it becomes inhibiting to one's functioning. And so this is where we're going to see the trauma. We're going to see... Um, some kind of physical disorder, like maybe there's an endocrine disorder. For me, I had polycystic ovary syndrome. So I had uh, something that was really weird with my and damaging to my functioning with my hormones, with my menstruation and my moods. Um, or maybe there's a some borderline personality uh, tr characteristics or complex PTSD characteristics, something that is arising to the level of dysfunction and not just something that is quirky, which I would define as, you know, kind of 
what, what I call funkiness. So being off beat, you know, marching to the beat of your own drum, something that's a little different and that might not fit in every environment or situation. So it might not always work out, but ultimately you can use those traits to, to thrive versus the weird traits. You're never going to thrive when you have those because those are a form of illness or, or a condition. Um, so what I've seen is, of course, with the autistic traits, of course, there's quirkiness. Um, that might just be that you're hyper fixated and very passionate about something that's unusual, which may inhibit your functioning until you get into the right environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've noticed these, these, these archetypes of, of women who they tend to have, you know, hyper fixations, they tend to have passions, they tend to have some issues with fitting in socially, um, at the, especially at the time when they're adopting the transition fantasy. So maybe their form of quirkiness is just that they're exploring their sexuality and they're, they have bisexual interests, or maybe their quirkiness is that they have um, uh, poorer social skills, or they're just very shy and quiet. Just something is a little bit off about them. But if they got into the right environment, they would be able to thrive with those traits. Um, And so I feel like in order to get to the point where uh, an adolescent or young adult would consider uh, a trans identity, they do have to have something that's prohibiting them from fitting in with other people. And maybe it's just a matter of that their quirkiness is just the fact that they're intellectually gifted. Um, Just Mm. beyond the creativity dimension, um, creativity is linked to intelligence, but maybe they're just intellectually gifted and they're thinking about things deeper than everyone else at whatever stage they're in, you know, high school or college. And so they feel like they can't relate to their peers. That's something that I've seen over and over and over again with the detransitioners and with um, trans identified people, right? They don't tend to be for the females, they don't tend to be people that that I would consider to be unintelligent. They're usually highly verbal, very competent in many Mm -hmm. sort of creative ways, Mm -hmm. but they tend to have social difficulties and they tend to have executive functioning difficulties um, and bodily integration difficulties. Yeah. And I'd love to add something on when I have, you know, thought about, worked with and just kind of considered all of the complicated issues around being intellectually precocious. And I guess I'll use that terminology. And precisely I'm using that terminology because even the term gifted is very off-putting to lots of young people who are intellectually precocious. I mean, you already feel like you don't quite fit in with the others. You don't want to use a word that seems arrogant or that seems like you think you're better than others, but you clearly do think about things more deeply. You have different types of interests than maybe other teenagers that are your age. So it's a very complicated thing to actually like come to terms with, acknowledge and like integrate into a community of other really intelligent kids that are not using that as like some sort of a bragging, right? Like it's a very weird place, I think, for a lot of young people to be. And it just makes them feel more, sometimes it makes them feel more alienated and more ostracized. And oftentimes, like you said about the environment, if a kid who has that profile gets into the right school environment and meets other really intelligent quirky kids like them, they can really thrive. But in the absence of that kind of sense of community and belonging, it can be really isolating. So that kind of goes to your point about kids who may consider a trans identity do so because there's something that creates a barrier to feeling like others and connected to others. Mm -hmm. I agree with you about the giftedness thing. That's, that's a term that I use now as an adult that I've sort of, yeah redeemed um because i didn't grow up feeling that i was gifted i wasn't like tested or placed into that category for for various reasons um mostly because i was very shy i think um Mm. but yes intellectually precocious i feel like this is what creates the confusion is that because you are intellectually um very stimulated and creatively stimulated 
and avant-garde, you feel a sense of, of depth that others around you maybe don't, but then you have social issues, um, which is again, very autistic, very, you know, ADHD typeology. But even just taking that away, if you feel, you know, like a genius in some ways and retarded in other ways to use my <laughs> language, um, I love you that. know, uh, yeah. yeah, like it's, it's going to feel like, wait a second, like, am I better than other people or am I worse than other people? Because I'm really good at Ooh. this and just really terrible at that. And that, you know, polarity creates, again, you're going to hyper fixate on that. You're going to hyper fixate on the self. You're, you're going to look inward to figure out what's wrong with you. And then yeah. when we get into the weird category, this is when you might actually have something that's causing you distress in a chronic way that is interfering with your life. Um, for me, I had undiagnosed complex PTSD uh, up until the age of 22 where it was diagnosed. Um, and that was from uh, parental abuse that was from psychological, verbal and emotional abuse. And um, so I was experiencing trauma symptoms and something was very wrong. Um, it wasn't with me at first, it was the environment that was wrong. And then my brain started to become wired to that wrong environment. And then I, my self-concept and self-esteem was pretty much obliterated. So the only, so basically I was just in this turmoil of constant reflection of trying to be like, okay, there is something wrong with me. You know, there's definitely, I'm not like I'm being emotionally hijacked, but what is this? Unfortunately, no one that I saw for counseling or psychiatry or at school or anywhere uh, understood that it was PTSD or, or relational um, trauma up until the age of 22, 23. That's when I finally learned about it. Um, and so maybe they have something like that going on. There's abuse. Maybe there's... Um, you know, kind of online abuse that's going on, or maybe they have, you know, a more severe form of, you know, uh, emotional dysregulation from a border, uh, uh, a bipolar or a manic depressive sort of perspective, um, or there's nutritional thing. I mean, there's so many reasons why you can have, you know, physiological issues going on or developmental um, issues even. Um, so that's kind of the weird. And I do think Ooh. that we see kids or adolescents that if they have those three criteria, they're quirky, sensitive, and creative, they can transition, right? Because that's what we see a lot of parents being like, well, they didn't really have any like major traumas, like it, they're, you know, but they're still adopting this. So I don't think you need the weird part, but if you have the weird part, it's going to be a lot harder for you to you know, number one, live a healthy life. Number two, come to the point of realization that, of, you know, of what's really going on with your, with your history of symptoms versus thinking, oh, this is, I need to transition. Um, because again, it's presented as the only solution for having, you know, any sort of gender related distress. Um, and sometimes it's just marketed as a form of creativity and liberation. So if you're someone who, lived in a traumatized body the way that I did, I had all those other things going on, which were vulnerability factors. And then I also bought into the idea that, you know, I wanted to conquer biology. I, I wanted to, you know, be stronger than nature. I wanted to, you know, not, it was very narcissistic. It was very much like, I want to become my own sort of God. I want to mm. uh, liberate myself from this prison of sexuality and all of I mean, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be nice? Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> um, it was a fantasy. Um, and it's taken me many years. Uh, and it's I'm still working on it still how to uh, deal with the, you know, the trauma. Um, can can so, I pause yeah. you for one second, Laura, because yeah. you've you've shared a lot so far, and I appreciate your candor. And Something just that I'll kind of share as a, a disclosure with you is like, I'm starting to 
kind of dig into the, the research and the current understanding around trauma. And what I'd like to do, obviously, that exploration has been very meaningful to you and helped you piece things together. But just for the sake of like clarifying, can if you were to use a different language to describe that without sharing more than you're comfortable with, like, would you say that the treatment you received as a child, like, created certain beliefs about yourself that perpetuated like really unhealthy behaviors or like, could you frame it in a way that if someone isn't really using the word like trauma and complex trauma and wiring, let's just reframe it so that maybe it could be more accessible for people. Is yeah, that okay? Of um, okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so I would describe it as I was afraid to trust other people uh, because my trust in my primary, in my parents, my primary yeah. caregivers who were supposed to take care of me, um, that trust was betrayed and it was betrayed over and over and over again. And then I was um, lied to, I was gaslit about what had happened by, by my family and by um, my parents who was being abusive and when the wires, you know, when you're a kid and you don't know, um, you don't have a lot of experiences with other people and your parent who is, you know, at one moment, my father would, you know, be screaming at me that I'm, you know, worthless and that he wishes I was never born. And he's screaming in my face and his mm. face is red and he's physically like, you know, getting, you know, close to me and, and threatening me. Um, and then the next day he's acting like nothing happened. And he's like, Oh, Laura, I made you dinner and I hear some ice cream. And then he's just like forcing, you know, we might call it love bombing. I don't think it was disingenuous when he was being loving, but at the same time, um, it felt like a very shallow love or affection that I couldn't trust because I'm just like, yeah. when is he going to just go back to the, he's like Jackal and Hyde. I didn't, I couldn't, like I didn't know that. Yeah. I, it was unpredictable, inconsistent. And when it's inconsistent, you're just going to be anxious or depressed all the time. You're either going to be really on edge or you're just going to detach completely because you don't know what to expect. Um, and so then all my other relationships, especially with men, um, and I pursued romantic and sexual relationships uh, very intensely um, to deal with that feeling of having like safe love or connection. And it always failed 100% of the time. Um, it was the same problem. So I'm feeling worthless. I'm feeling unlovable. I'm feeling disgusting. I'm feeling shame. And then I'm feeling like I'm craving love and connection mm. and trust and friendship with others but they never give it to me. Or if they do give it like as a platonic friend, maybe it, it never feels enough. So I just feel empty inside. Um, and I'm simultaneously getting extremely angry sometimes crying pretty much every mm -hmm. day. Um, you know, so that's kind of how it's manifesting, um, without using clinical language. I, I appreciate you sharing that. It's, it sounds like a very, confusing and, and heartbreaking experience to go through. And I can understand how that has impacted trust and, and your feeling of being able to just be, be easy around people. I mean, that that's what's coming to my mind. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for like the, the less clinical angle of it. So that's, yeah. that's the, the, the way you kind of think about one version of this weird thing, meaning like something is going on with this young person that is actually quite detrimental, which is a different level than the quirkiness. Yes. Um, so mm. again, the quirkiness is kind of like, it is something about the person themselves, their personality or their bodies. And it is about them. The weirdness is typically something that's been a, a severe circumstance, um, okay. something that's very severe, and then their body is reacting to that. 
So typically some kind okay. of traumatic or, um, I mean, again, I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't know enough to get into the debate about like, you know, nature versus nurture in terms of causing, um, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. chemical imbalances or whatever. Um, but, but yeah, I do think there's a distinction. Um, but again, when you, even if you don't have, you know, literal brain damage, like you do with, with PTSD, you, as a quirky, um, sensitive, uh, adolescent or young adult, you're still going to feel things very intensely. And, um, you're still going to be searching for a sense of self. You're still going to be trying to find your tribe and purpose mm -hmm. and meaning of life. So even if you don't have any extreme factors whatsoever, you can still mm -hmm. be very vulnerable. If you're willing, to, if you are open to considering the, that transition is real or legitimate or healthy, if you're opening to considering that there is such a thing as a trans or non-binary person, if you're even willing to entertain that idea, you are vulnerable to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors, Genspect and Therapy First. Genspect is an international organization committed to fostering a healthy approach to sex and gender. The team and members of Genspect strive to promote high quality, evidence-based care for gender non-conforming individuals. Genspect is pleased to offer a non-medicalized approach to gender with their recently published Gender Framework and they continue to hold conferences around the world. Visit genspect.org to learn more. Therapy First is a non-profit worldwide professional association of mental health providers who view psychotherapy as the appropriate first-line treatment for gender dysphoria. Therapy First supports psychotherapists working with gender dysphoric youth and young adults and offers public education on mental health and psychotherapy. Visit therapyfirst.org to learn more. Now back to the show. And so when you wrote this piece, what feedback have you gotten? Have, have I imagine lots of people have written into you saying either, oh, my kid is a lot like that, or I, I am, I've had gender dysphoria and I'm a lot like that. Or have you, I mean, what, what has the response been to this formulation of the kind of archetype? Um, it's exactly what you said. I've gotten a lot of parents saying that this is exactly like my daughter. She's on the autism spectrum, or I think she's on the autism spectrum. She's just a quirky girl who's very, you know, emotional and sensitive. And she likes to draw or she likes anime or whatever she's creatively into. Um, and she's just caught up in this. Or I'll get um, parents, you know, saying like, this is exactly how I am. And I know that if I had been your age, you know, um, when this came out, this idea was presented that I would have probably fallen for it. And then in terms of like my peers, the other detransitioners, mm -hmm. um, they've also had a response to it and, um, and, and agreed that, that they would fit into this. Um, and I feel like if you really look at like almost any of the public detransitioners, I mean, it yeah. just seems very obvious to me, maybe I'm a little biased, but um, <laughs> that they would all fall into this because all of them are so intelligent. They're so, yeah. um, you know, sensitive. They're so loving, um, yeah. articulate. They're all writers. They're all artists, like every single one. So I don't yeah. think that it's just a coincidence. No. And it's interesting that you brought up being writers and artists because I've been thinking about the relationship between like beauty and self-expression and creativity and the way that kind of fits into he to here, because something that's really interesting is that a lot of the very, and I'll tell you about a trajectory I've seen and you tell me what you think about it. A lot of the really creative kids that, that you've described who get into this, the initial stages seem to include a complete discarding of all the beautiful things they love in an attempt to like fit into this box of what it means to be a guy. And it's like the joy is sucked out of them. 
the creativity and like magic of like colors and makeup and like all these things that they used to love. And then sometimes I also hear, and then usually they kind of try to circle back to reincorporate those things after some time, I guess, depending on how quickly they move into like a medical transition or not. But sometimes I also hear, you know, parents saying, I don't understand. My daughter still wears eyeliner and earrings, but calls herself a boy. And I don't understand. Like she doesn't even try to look like a guy or whatever. And to me, I'm like, well, the last thing you want to do is actually rob her of the things she finds beautiful, because that's such an important part of what makes us feel alive, for lack of a better term. So I don't know. I mean, we could probably talk about this for a while, but I just love to hear your thoughts, especially as an artist and somebody who is a creative type, how does this all fit in here? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I have a, a theory that it's a form of um, creative misdirection. So there's this creative impulse, which is very spontaneous. It's intense. It can be emotional. It could be very physical. You're just like, okay, I have the muse is hitting me now. I have to do something. Um, and, you know, that impulse is going to be the same no matter what you're going to channel it into. But what ha happens is that because so many creative types um, are open to this ideology, they, they're they searching many ideologies. It's not just this mm. is the only one. I mean, they're very into so many different things. They're into so many different fandoms. They're into so many different forms of expression. And then they find uh, queer theory. And then that seems, you know, extremely interesting. And it obviously is. We wouldn't be talking about it so much all the time uh, if, if it wasn't. Um, but they then start to think that it can be a sort of a panacea to help other problems. And so then it's not just an intellectual pursuit but it can become a hyperfixation and a fantasy of liberation, liberation from depression, from bodily um, discomfort, from just normal angst of life um, and from, you know, a feeling of alienation. So they then start to get, you know, really fixated on it. And then they start to lose some of their former interests because they think that they can then fit everything under this umbrella of, of queerness. And what mm -hmm. queerness is essentially is just um, any, just destroying anything that's normal. And so again, you know, that could be seen as a neutral statement, like a morally neutral statement or a not neutral statement at all, where how queer people would view that statement would be that's a very positive thing. We must destroy everything that's normal because everything is subjective. There is no inherent meaning. Um, and when you're getting into that sort of philosophy at, at a younger age, when you don't have the life experience or the relation, the mentors or relationships to, to sort of reality test that it's going to seem like that's the answer. And mm -hmm. so you're going to start destroying your past self, destroying you know, any notion of what's real, that's going to create a fragmented self. And so the only thing left is the ideology itself, is the queerness, is is the transness. And the any, everything is then co coded within um, the concept of transness. And depending on what variety they adopt, maybe there's the non-binary variety, which is the, which I view as the most creative types would adopt the non-binary mm -hmm. because the non-binary says I can dress however I want and I can be um, completely androgynous one day or feminine the next or masculine and I can do surgeries or not and I'm still queer or trans because in their eyes queer is not just a noun but it's also a verb because they're being queer. I've seen videos where Non-binary women um, are saying, even if you're LGBT and even if you're trans, if you're not part of the revolution, you're not queer. Mm. You're not actually trans mm -hmm. because to them, it's it's about um, deconstructing everything versus the other variety that some might, you know, get into is the very rigid thinking that, OK, I must pass. I yeah. must, you know, completely conform. And so yeah. I think.
there's these two varieties and it's pretty easy to tell which one um, that someone's in. That's why you're going to see the girls that are calling themselves trans, but they're just dressing the same as they were before. Or you're going to see the girls that, you know, throw away all their makeup and then start, you know, you know, putting on this performance of masculinity. You know, as we talk about this, of course, I can hear lots of different reactions to what you're saying, but I, I want to acknowledge that I think there's something about the, let's say, like old school transsexual person who wants to conform to the sex role of their desired sex, that if they pass, of course, this doesn't feel threatening to like everyday normies because they still fit into some of the same characteristic boxes. So I really can empathize and sympathize with the non-binary way of thinking and even some aspects of the queer way of thinking that is like, let's break down all these boxes. Now, of course, what I believe happens is that just there are new boxes erected that everyone has to then slot into and it becomes a total language game. But I just want to say, like, I can empathize and sympathize with that. I get wanting to take the way everybody feels restricted and throw it out. But ultimately, you know, that's not necessarily what happens. There's still restrictions. There's always some sort of a boundary when, especially when it's a language-based movement and ideology. Yeah. And one thing that I have realized, because that's the route that I took, um, even though I medicalized, I had um, double mastectomy and took testosterone, I adopted the non-binary path, the avant-garde queer path. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And what I've, what I've realized um, since detransitioning is that I was, I thought that I was freeing myself and becoming more creatively um, liberated, but I was actually limiting myself because I, like, for example, I had my breasts removed. I thought that was going to free me from, you know, femininity or womanhood or all of these ideas that I had around being female. Mm -hmm. But now I feel like my clothing options are actually limited. I felt like my breasts are limiting my clothing options in the past when I wanted to present more as ma masculine or pass as male. Now, if I, you know, um, now I'm comfortable with dressing more femininely, but when I was in my androgynous sort of detransitioning phase, I was like, I've actually limited my expression because now I have these huge scars and I don't have a normal looking body and I can't wear certain clothes. Like, and there was a sense mm -hmm. of mourning because I can't go to the club. Um, not that I would ever go to a club anymore, but a couple of years ago in my early twenties, I can't go to the club and like wear a, you know, a shortcut um, shirt or, you know, these other clothing items that in the past I had, you know, was like, well, I'll never want to wear those. I'll have nothing to do with those. Then as mm -hmm. I became more creatively open to those other forms of expression, the more yeah. feminine um, t styles of clothing and accessories, I realized like, oh, now I can't even really do that. So actually my attempt to be more creatively open failed um, because I destroyed, because I, because I presumed uh, that... I would never want to have anything to do with femininity. And if you are closing off anything to do with femininity or womanhood or femaleness, um, or for a man, the opposite, you're going to be really limited in life because there's so much more creatively that you can do when you embrace, um, you know, a little mixture of both, like a collage. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's such a tangible, concrete, and in a way, violent way of trying to assert your exploration, your rejection of norms. Like, wow, what a physical way to say, I'm rejecting femininity right now, and I'm going to do it in a way that's permanent. I mean, and I don't know if this is true, but I, I wonder if we could go back in time and, and ask you about that. Because you said, you know, I thought I'd never want to express femininity. I suspect that you might also say something like, well, even if I want to one day, I'll be perfectly happy doing that without breasts. 
or like I'll be androgynous. So it will, I'll be fine expressing femininity even without this part of my body. Like, is that accurate to say? I, don't, I certainly don't want to put words. Yeah. I, I would I say wonder. that's accurate. Yeah. And that's, that's accurate. Have I think how I would have responded in the past and also of what I've observed from currently trans or non-binary identified individuals in their videos and things. Um, and you know, I mean, that is a point, like I could play devil's advocate for my former self. Um, and, and, you know, see that point of view that, oh, well, I don't need to have breasts to be, to express femininity. Just like I was said, I don't need to have a penis to, you know, live as a gay man. Um, mm. But it, if I really was to, you know, sit down and talk with that former self, I would say like, I mean, who are you to say that? Who are you to say that you can mm. be a gay man without a penis? because I've tried it and it didn't work because gay men are not sexually attracted to a female body. And so that's a fantasy that you're having that you've convinced yourself that that's going to be possible. It's not possible. It's not naturally possible. Um, the same thing with expressing femininity without breast. Yes. I, I mean, I do express femininity without breast today, right? Like I, I yeah. present it in a very variety of ways. However, yeah. there's a fundamental feeling of, of grief that comes with that. And even though I, I do the best that I can and make the most of what I do have in my creative abilities and like, I, you know, I call it like sexual signaling, like female sexual mm -hmm. signaling of heterosexuality. Like I do the best I can, um, but there's still a feeling of uh, disfigurement um, because I've now been able to accept that that part of my body was beautiful. It did have many creative uses. Yes, it had some limitations. And it, yes, it signaled me as a female. But now I've matured to the point where that's okay with me. Because one, yeah. and so within the bounds of creativity, you always want to have at least some constraints you know, and this is a creative person's problem, right? Is that they have so many ideas that maybe they end up doing nothing versus like, if you only had a piece of paper and a pencil and maybe you're like, Oh, I wish I had glitter or paint or whatever, but you don't have that. Yeah. Make something out of what you have. That's going to be better than if you're trying to just fantasize or imagine all these different possibilities and then deny what's yeah. right in front of you. Yeah, it's like the, the paralysis of too many options. And I mean, I come from a family of artists and creative people, and they, they happen to be in the field of design, like designing uh, commercial buildings. And the restraints that are presented in the project are what create the absolute beauty and, and conditions in which they have to work to make the final product. But if they had a boundless budget and a boundless type of user and a boundless type of materials, they would be paralyzed and not be able to get anything done. I mean, it's just, it's like a fundamental human thing that we need some sort of constraints to be productive and effective. Right. And that's literally like the human question of, of mortality. Like yeah. if we didn't have death, would we ever be, would we ever act morally? Or what would we do if we, if we had an unlimited amount of life or a youth um, you know, and that's what I feel is a fundamental issue with, with when you are, although I don't agree with transition as a solution to managing, um, you know, men, uh, distress for any age, mm -hmm. philosophically, I'll say if you've matured, you know, to, you know, over the age of 25 adult, and you have, you know, done adequate, um, you know, mentorship or therapy or whatever, and, and you decide to do those body modifications, I'm not going to stop you. I take a libertarian approach to that. But when I look at a young adult or a teenager, um, and they think that they have any concept of the human condition, right? They don't yeah. have, their brain isn't fully formed. They're not able to actually conceptualize the future and how time will pass as an adult. Yeah. Um, you know, that's when I say, I don't think you can make a permanent decision like that because, you know, you need that constraint to help you grow and you're going to keep pushing against nature as much as, 
you know, you can or need to. And then eventually, once you become fully developed in your natural form, then you can accept it and then make the most of it. And so that's why I don't, you know, philosophically altering the body in that way. Um, And again, like, I I feel the same way about, like, there's a difference between arguing uh, morally and arguing legally, like morally, Mm -hmm. I, or philosophically, I would say it's probably not the best idea to get a tattoo, you know, under the age of 24 or something like that, but I'm not going to ban it. Um, yeah. you know, but yeah, do, so do I think that transition is ethical or, um, you know, a good idea? No, I don't optimal. for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. It's not optimal. It's not ideal. Um, but I'm not going to prevent you know, people that are adults who have lived experience, who are rational to, from, from doing that on their own, um, you know, personal dime. But, um, when it comes to children or at least like under 21s, um, I think that's completely unethical because there's no possible way that they can really contemplate, uh, morality essentially. It's and and reproductive. Yeah. I agree. And what I think is unethical is when people of any age, and I mean, obviously for children, I think it should be a non, non-starter, like it should not be allowed ever, but people of any age go into the process of transition under a lot of false illusions. And nobody from their psychiatric team or mental health team or physician's team ever telling them the truth about what is and is not possible with those body modifications. And I think if people are making a well-informed, very sober decision without like totally crazy fantasies about what this can and can't do for my happiness, like going into it as like a body modification, like getting a plastic surgery or a tattoo or whatever, that is not the same as what's happening to a lot of young people who believe that this is going to kind of magically turn me into this other kind of person. So that's, I think, so unethical. And I think that's a question that not a lot of people seem to be talking about because it's either like, oh, this person's truly trans. They were dysphoric since they were babies. Or this is a mentally unwell girl who's got swept up in a social contagion. It's like, well, actually, wait a minute. There are lots of people who have the right to have a sober, well-informed, grounded understanding of what they're signing up for, regardless of those other factors. Right. And so that's why I think it's a, it's a medical ethics question. And again, we can still debate the philosophy. Is anyone truly trans? I don't think so. Um, I mean, I'll, yeah. just, I'll just say it. I, I don't think that there is any true trans. I do think there are people who have uh, genetic or physiological um, quirks basically that, that have, um, that, that cause for, for whatever reason, maybe it's their sexuality that causes them to mm-hmm. be non-conforming. Um, mm-hmm. there's definitely people that are non-conforming. Um, and so, you know, if they choose, if they make a fully rational and informed decision, um, as an older adult to manage their quirkiness, again, I don't philosophically agree with that, but yeah. I think they should be able to make that decision. Um, but yeah. it doesn't matter the age of the person, right? Cause you know, I was 19 and 20. I don't really consider that a mature adult. Um, and certainly I was even, I was had a lot of trauma and, and developmental delays. So I don't think I was mature at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's people older than me, you know, um, Richard Enumene, for example, is a detransitioner. He was, um, I believe 25 or 26 when he had um, medicalization. And so it's yeah. like, oh, okay, he's over the age of 25. He should be able to do whatever he wants, right? Well, Richard had schizophrenia and Richard yeah. had like severe trauma um, and he was not given informed consent, um, nor could yeah. he really consent into those circumstances. So it's not yeah. for me just about, you know, child versus adult. Yeah. It's because we see like the college um, age students are some of the most indoctrinated and the most unwell yeah. and they're technically adults yeah. who can do whatever they want. Um, mm-hmm. So that kind of laissez faire 
argument, well, adults can do whatever they want. That seems very lazy to me. And so I'm really trying to sort of break that narrative and say, no, you know, I get it. Like, yes, the kids are more blatantly unethical, but it's still unethical to offer, you know, poor met or like abusive or neglectful medical care in any circumstance. Yeah. And I've heard you speak about this medical ethics framing. And when I first heard you talk about this, it was in Ireland at the GenSpec conference. And I thought it was such a brilliant way to help people understand the deeper issues here. Because I do think gender can become this smoke screen and then people are like, oh, do I not think trans people are real? And then everyone gets sidelined. But the way you frame it is really great. So we're going to pause here. But if you're interested in hearing Laura talk more about this framing of medical ethics, uh, please join us for this additional segment that's going to be in with our premium subscribers and Substack. And if you want to hear more of our conversation, you can go there at widerlenspod.com and sign up for the paid membership. So for the rest of our listeners, I guess we will sign off here and say goodbye. Anything else you want to, to say, like maybe information that you want to share for our listeners to find you? Of course, we'll include anything that you send us in the notes. Yeah. Um, if you don't know already, I'm on Twitter very actively um, under Funky Psyche. I also have a Substack, also called Funky Psyche, and I'm on YouTube. Um, I also have a, a store, funkgod.shop, which has, you know, very funky kind of clothes. Sasha has- I have your pants. Uh, <laughs> yes. And shorts yes, and a shirt. <laughs> and shorts. But yeah. I also have um, like detransitioner awareness items, weight, um, apparel, or like pins and things that you can support detransitioners and also a few anti-woke things uh, if you're into that too. Um, in terms of other thoughts, I think uh, I, oh, I'm, I'm uh, writing a memoir. So I'm, I'm in the middle right now of writing my memoir. That's it's um, focused more so generally on um, just, a case study of, of growing up, you know, as on the autism spectrum as a Gen Z woman. But so I tackle a lot of different mental health issues, cultural issues, um, but it's specifically tied through the lens of gender. So I'll talk about, you know, the beginning, middle, you know, of my transition, detransition, and then doing a much deeper dive into kind of an existential uh, philosophical and, and healing um base perspective. So just, I don't, it's not out yet. I just, I'm just hyping it up right now as, pro, as promotion. That's great. I'm sure a lot of people will like that. Thanks, Sasha. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Laura. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And be sure to visit us on Substack by going to widerlenspod.com. There you can join our listener community, access bonus content and resources, plus learn about additional ways to support the show. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.